Hi, this is Everyday Expertise, and I'm Angela, and I'm here today with critically acclaimed singer-songwriter Lauren Hoffman. Hello! Hi, Angela. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. So uh, let's get started with uh, how did you get started making music? I got started making music as a kid. Like, it was very much a part of my home life, Mm -hmm. so it wasn't something that I had to go out of my way to discover or be interested or be a part of. It was kind of came from my dad. Like, so my parents were into it. It was the seventies, but we lived like it was the forties or something. And they they were into sort of a live off the land hippie thing. And my dad loved music. My mom also was kind of into it. She picked up the penny whistle and Irish uh, flute at some point, but it was more with my dad that I kind of developed this just love for songwriting and um we listened to the Beatles and Bob Marley and John Prine and all kinds of stuff I had a record player in my room uh when I was like younger than five so it was just a part of my life but um I didn't really start playing music and knowing what my instrument was or what I really wanted to do until I was about 12. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and that was when I started writing songs and playing guitar. I had tried like taking piano lessons, but the structure of it and the way it was kind of organized it just clashed with my sense of music and what I heard. And I have a I have a good ear, which can be like um, a blessing and a curse because if you can figure it out faster than you can read it by just knowing what it's supposed to be, Mm-hmm. then you won't learn to read it. But then when things get more complicated, you haven't built that reading skill. And mm. so that's kind of a funny balance. But, you know, with guitar and with rock music and pop music and songwriting, it felt very much like you can just figure it out as, as you go and, and learn as you go. And so that was what really appealed to me and became like an emotional outlet for me at 12 and 13. So that's when I got started writing. When did you realize that, that was going to be your career? Hmm. I think that I, I have to say when I was, when I was 13, 14, I was very depressed and mm-hmm. unhappy and disillusioned, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. Somebody was writing on Facebook yesterday about the challenger explosion like when we were in school and mm. I was like eight. Um, and I was sort of thought about that as being the beginning of this thing that led towards me being 12, 13 and very like, oh yeah, like science, great, school, great, success, you know, equality. Like let's all talk a bunch of bullshit about how, you know, life is going to be. And I was like, I don't buy into it, you know? And so that was part of what appealed to me too about, I guess I felt like I was going to be involved in music in some way. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I thought I would be a performer because I'm, I don't have a very performer personality. <laughs> I'm much more of like a, like a studio artist or mm-hmm. I like to go off into my own little world more than that face-to-face connecting thing that performance is about. So, um, I'm not sure that I knew I would do it as a career. I'm not sure I would have quite pushed for it as a career. It, life kind of led me in that direction. Mm. Hmm. That's interesting. I don't know how much you know about my story. So, <laughs> well, I mean, I've, I've probably read, you know, I've read Wikipedia, right. Mm-hmm. I've listened to your music. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I mean, I mean, like, like you were you were talking about, um, your, your depression as a teenager. I mean, a lot, a lot of your songs touch on sort of dark themes, yeah. sort of addiction, trauma, you know, et cetera. What about those themes really appeals to you as an artist? What really like serves as an inspiration? For you? me, I think that songwriting is, uh, like a place where it's appropriate to Mm -hmm. release emotions like a song is kind of an emotion the story of a song is the story of a feeling um to me and like that's the place to put it whereas in normal life like you you don't you know show up to school or to the gas station and like 
with all those emotions. <laughs> um, but I also came from a family where people didn't have those kinds of boundaries and there was a lot of intensity and a lot of emotions. There wasn't any room for, for me. <laughs> um, and so this was my place, like where I could, where I could appropriately express those things. And uh, it's not always about me. A lot of it is about what I've seen happen to other people or what I've had other people seen other people go through. And sometimes it's metaphorical. Sometimes mm -hmm. those themes are ways of talking about a like the narrative of the feeling, the feeling that would make you want to just like drown yourself in drugs, even if you still don't and you go around your life being a functional person. Mm -hmm. But that feeling is that's one way that a lot of times people express it or communicate it or try to fix it or work on it. For me, it's more often, hopefully a healthier uh, outlet, which is, which is the music. Mm -hmm. But I will say that like music feels healthy, but, but the music business does not. And, and, and what the music business turned into over the time I've been doing it has changed and is now I feel kind of unhealthy mm -hmm. in a different way but actually in a way that I think a lot of people can relate to you know the feeling of yeah overly self-conscious like seeing how you're being presented all the time through by being by doing YouTube by having an Instagram or anything like that and it's because yeah. you can be kind of a mind fuck to like look back at yourself so much and judge yourself so much whereas writing music and playing music can feel very much like just expressing yourself just being yourself mm or being that feeling or, and releasing it. But looking back at yourself, like it feel, it can feel really good to cry. You don't want to see a video of yourself crying. You know what I mean? No, probably not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so there's a tricky balance I find, um, mm -hmm. between those things. I went off mm -hmm. in a little bit of a different direction. I don't remember the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you answered it. Okay. Oh, about the themes. Yeah. Yeah. And I also did feel very self-destructive at, at that age, at this mm. young age, when I was 12, 13, 14, that was a lot of what I saw, I think, around me of the examples of, if you feel this way, you do these things. If if you feel like I feel, what I was seeing is, if you feel like I feel, you like die of a heroin overdose. Like mm. <laughs> that was something that I could relate that feeling to, but it wasn't what I actually wanted to do, especially when, um, I was 14, I had a kind of a, kind of a near death experience and it changed my sense of like, I've never been suicidal since then right. because wow. it's always out there. It's definitely going to happen. That's you might yeah. as well stick around and figure it out. Mm. So that was when it changed that I knew I didn't want to be a self-destructive person. But then, you know, what we want to be and what we actually do are not always the same thing. And mm -hmm. um, so I think those those feelings, those uh, the distress inside of me has led me to do different things in my life that I wouldn't say that I was choosing necessarily, um, like an eating disorder or getting kind of like sucked a little bit into a culty situation, <laughs> things like that, or toxic relationships or any of that. Um, and songs feel like the place where I work that out. I work out what happened. Why did I, why was I there? What was, what was this, what was driving me it, it's often a, a pro the songwriting itself is often a process of self-discovery it's like mm -hmm. like I said it's like my it's like the story of the feeling it's like the feeling telling yeah. me it's it's exactly. catharsis essentially yeah if you mean like a yeah. change of from one thing catharsis is like a change or like it used to be uh alchemy is the word right that's yeah. used metaphorically um in that way it can be. Yeah, it can be. Yeah, it's that sort of that release of emotion. Yeah. Uh -huh. Which you can also get through other people, like listening to music too, oh, yeah, of course, or, yeah. or going to a show. I've never been as much of a live show person, either per performing or going. Mm -hmm. um, but sort of the feeling of 
maybe like when I lived in New York City, walking around, you know, with my headphones on and listening to something and like kind of walking and feeling this feeling. And, you know, by the time you're done with that, you, you've, you've had a catharsis that the feeling has been kind of exercised or it's been um, allowed to say what it needed to say and, mm. and then not sort of fuck up your life from underneath, which is nice. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. Okay, so um, musical influences. I mean, you talked about uh, when you were young, there was lots of music in your in your home. Yeah. And but what would you say are your major influences in your work? Well, probably the the things that I mentioned, like the early influences, would be um, probably like John Lennon a lot and Bob Dylan. Those kinds of songwriters. And then I was uh, the right age to be like a little kid fangirl when 80s new wave came into mm. the world, which I loved. Um, and I love like a dark pop song. I love the kind of combination between something like catchy and melodically pleasant and with a beat mm. or those things that you associate with pop music, but that also has a sense of something genuine or clever or new or unusual to it. And then when I was getting into more of that age uh, of 12 and 13, when things started to go a little dark, uh, that was when I discovered like Sinead O'Connor and then grunge music was happening. And a lot of the music of that time was very dark and kind of simple. Like it came out of punk rock, which, you know, was okay to just bang out chords and be in, just have an attitude, you know? And then grunge felt like, or the 80, 90s, like not necessarily grunge because that wasn't really what I was into. I was more like kind of into PJ Harvey and uh, The Cure and Pixies. Mm. And, but then I also like one of my favorite movies of all time is Amadeus. And I love listening to like certain classical music. I love jazz. My, my teacher, my music teacher was a jazz trumpeter, John Durth. And he taught me so much and, mm. uh, but I've never played actual jazz. So I don't know. My influences have often been like my, my daughter says that I like a little bit of all music. And I was like, yeah, I like good songs. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be from, I think that there's mm -hmm. maybe a, there's certain themes that are, they're not genre specific, but they might be melodically similar in mm -hmm. different kinds of uh, genres that is what I respond to the most, but I haven't mm. like really analyzed it too deeply. Um, I also really love storyteller singer songwriters like Amy Mann. And um, let's see, I don't know. I've gone through so many phases. Like I love Metallica. I fucking love Nine Inch Nails. I have mm. since I was 14. Um, and I feel like some of my, you know, guitar riffs come from having learned a lot of Metallica. What, I know that like people don't listen to my music and go, she's definitely got a strong Metallica influence. Although I do sometimes, it's it's not been uncommon for me to get the feedback of like, I never listen to singer songwriters. I only listen to death metal, but I love your music. <laughs> so that's cool. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's kind of entirely normal to go through phases, you know be into something for a little while and then something else and something else. And then just have all that kind of meld into your, your sort of, I don't know, creative bank, you could say. Yeah. I mean, one of the things yeah. that's kind of co confusing to me a little bit when people talk about influences is that it makes it sound like what I do is I have to say not incredibly intentional the way that the music comes out. I feel like I'm listening and I'm following along and and experiencing it in real time and it's becoming what it is. And I know that those influences are there because I hear them later. Like, um, I'll go like, Oh, that's kind of got this little 
you know, there's this one song, uh, there's this one background vocal thing on my latest record on the song, Fix Me Up Love. There's this one background vocal thing that I did. And then when I heard it back later, I was like, oh, that reminds me of this one moment from the Bjork record, um, Homogenic. But I don't think that, I mean, it wasn't like I went in and I was like, let's see which part of this Bjork thing I want to sound like. So yeah. I know a lot of bands are formed or artists start their thing wanting to do a particular thing and then making it become the picture in their head. Mm-hmm. And that's not how it is for me. Yeah. No, and I mean, I think that makes sense. I think the language just doesn't really describe things properly, right? Like, yeah, we see, we use influences, but it really, I mean, I think when it comes to creativity, you're always pulling things, like everything is sort of, like I said, going into that creative bank. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But some people can be really rule bound about it. I mean, oh, I yeah. find that there are large swaths of mm-hmm. the music business or people who are making music who kind of have things categorized in a way that I much prefer to fuck up. Like Mm -hmm. I would much rather say like, well, yeah, let's, let's make it like, um, I don't know. I don't know how to like something that sounds like it should be a folk song and let's put an instrument on it that shouldn't be there or, um, you know, now I hear a lot of quiet singer songwriters over hip hop beat, but when we put out Broken in 2006, that wasn't um, exactly happening at the time. So. But it's an awesome song. Thanks. Mm-hmm. So, okay. Uh, I mean, we talk a lot about process on this show. So, yeah. can you sort of describe for me your uh, songwriting process, say, from idea to finished song? Well, I feel like in a way I've already kind of said it. Yeah, (laughs) we've probably covered a little bit of it. Yeah, yeah. But then there's also, you know, there are more, you know, technical aspects of it. And one of the things I feel really glad about is that that computer recording wasn't a thing when I was starting out. And I and I learned how to play guitar so that I could play my songs, Mm. so that they would not be in my head, so that you know I could show you what it is, Mm -hmm. and. Uh, that's how I write. I write, you know, with an, there's, there's just like this thing, this feeling like a little melody I want to figure out, or I start playing something and I think, oh, that's cool. And then it just turns, it has to be kind of like, it has to just happen. But Mm. on the other hand, it can't just happen if you don't have the skills, you know? So to some degree, you, you know, you do have to, um, be, uh, methodical about parts of it, but then in another way, you have to leave room and not push. Like for me, I, if I sit down to write a song, most of the time that has not actually happened. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I've almost never said, I'm going to write a song today and then wrote a song. Mm -hmm. Um, it's much more kind of the editing. There's like the inspiration and the, and the rushing to find a space or a way to follow that inspiration. Like if you're in the car, okay, I'll, I'll hum it into my phone. And then when I get home, if it's still in my head or maybe, uh, maybe some lyrics will kind of come to me and I'll write those down. And then when I have a chance to follow the inspiration, I'll follow it. But keeping the editor out of the room or out of my mind or other, what other people would think of the presentation or any of that, Mm -hmm. it needs to stay away from the sort of like expression part. Mm -hmm. And when I see people writing while also recording on computers and building out the tracks and everything to me, it seems like it's, it's doing those at the same time. And, Mm -hmm. and I, I, people are still making good music. Um, but, uh, when they're, when they're not, when it sounds like kind of a lot of the right stuff, but something's missing, like it's just not really okay. The sounds are all, it sounds like a song. Why, why doesn't it feel like a song? Like what, what's, my suspicion is that it's partly from doing those things at the same time, Mm -hmm. instead of writing a song you could play on one instrument and then orchestrating, figuring it out or, or, or editing it or remixing it or, you know, changing up the orchestration or every throwing the guitar away and putting all of that into keyboards, you know, 
but I feel like the songwriting process should be for me, you know, that's how it is. Hmm. No, I mean, it's everyone's process is their own. Exactly. That's the idea. Yeah. I do think that that's one thing that makes like dance music and certain electronic music different. And it wouldn't make sense as a Mm. thing to write on a song, uh, write on a guitar. Mm -hmm. It, it probably comes from the inspiration comes from some beat or some sound. And then, Oh, I can put this filter on that and it's going to do that wash that I like. And then it turns into a thing and it's similar to what Mm -hmm. I experience as songwriting with, words and um voice and one instrument how long uh would you say that it, it on average takes you to write a song and complete it like an hour 30 minutes i don't know mm-hmm. but uh that doesn't necessarily mean that i shouldn't have spent more time on it um recently i have had this big project of trying to deal with the last 20 years of technology on the internet and my music is distributed in uh, different ways with different, it's like a whole mess that is Mm -hmm. starting to come together, which I'm so glad about. Um, but I've been during that process. I've been sort of reviewing Mm -hmm. all these, uh, all these albums that I made and all this stuff that I put out. And, you know, if I had thought about it too much, then maybe I never would have, done it I mean to some degree I feel like I've only put out as much music as I have because I've had a bit of a policy of like just do it just put it don't wait don't wait for the perfect Mm. moment don't wait for the perfect version like it's time to move on there's more songs coming you know Mm. so um and it's funny because from the blue house my second record has (laughs) like it gets a lot of love. It got really great reviews and people talk to me about it a lot and they say how much they love it. The song Sugar Pie is just ridiculous. And the song Magic Stick is really terrible. But, you know, I'm glad that people, I'm glad I didn't overthink it and I put it out and the people who dig it, dig it. And if you don't, you don't have to listen to it, you know? So it's true. Um, then there's other things like with uh, with Mercury Girls and just also just in the last like 10 since having my daughter. So I kind of when I had my daughter in, in 2008, um, I was sort of like, OK, I'm going to not really do like the music business stuff. Obviously, I play guitar and piano and r- write songs or play songs mm-hmm. or sing or whatever. That's personal. Um, but as far as putting stuff out or any of the kind of more professional side of it. Mm -hmm. I was, I was like, I'm not really going to do this. And partly because, and I know I'm getting kind of off track from what you asked, but it's partly because choreography, I put that out in 2006. I had worked on it for four years. I knew it was a great record (laughs) and I, and, and I had meetings at record companies and the, the industry was in so much flux. I mean, it still is, but I would say that the last five years have been way more stable than the previous 15 before. And so like in 2005, 2006, it was emo. It was like Mm. my chemical romance and stuff like that. It was all this stuff that five years later, like nobody was talking about. Um, But anyway, uh, it just kind of didn't happen. The, The record came out in France on an indie label, which was cool, but that indie label also like a lot of times in the music business, there's this certain amount of energy that people have to push through the suckage. And then when the sucking just is too much, they give up. And then, so, so that label kind of like was folding just around the same time as I was um, finishing up my touring there and stuff like that. And it was just depressing. And I felt like, well, if that record couldn't, you know, do it, then Mm. Fuck it, you know. But then when in 2012, like I don't know what happened, but Broken started um playing just a ton on Pandora radio. Mm. And I think it was partly because of the rise of like the XX, um, people listening to a station a lot that was based on Mazzy Star that played my songs and my songs mm. just kind of being on some of these um chill but dark melancholy 
female. So, um, so that turned into like a big boost for me of like, this is that thing. This is that natural thing where people, um, where the song did it by itself. It wasn't a push. It wasn't marketing money. It wasn't a trick. It wasn't, Mm. um, any of those things. And, um, and that was just really, that meant so much to me that I decided to kind of get back into it. But since then, and working on the record I did with The Secret Storm, which now is not on streaming and I'm having technical difficulties figuring out how to get it back on. Um, and then Mercury Girls, it's just very, there's so, besides being now also a mom, there are so many things, there are so many distractions. It's really hard to take the time to kind of focus on, is the song finished? Are these the lyrics that you really Mm -hmm. want to be the final lyrics. And so there were, there are some things, there are times when um, I feel like I could have spent more time with some of the songwriting Uh, shadow of the moon uh, got, I wrote it very quickly after the incident in Charlottesville, which Mm -hmm. when I was living there and then recorded it. But then later I was like, you know what? This needs a bridge. And I love the bridge that I wrote for it. Now, even later, I kind of go, the opening lines are not so great. There's kind of like, there's like a they and then another they, and they're different they's. It's not clear, but it's not metaphorical really either. It's Mm -hmm. kind of, a lot of times my first lyrics are a little bit throwaway and maybe I should actually throw them away. (laughs) Because they're the ones that get the song started doesn't mean they're going to be the best. I feel like my second verses usually are the better ones. <laughs> I think it's like that for for most sort of writing in yeah. general. Yeah. That's just what editing is for, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes I haven't really gone back and edit. I, I don't want to mess with them too much either, because like I said, like... Yeah. No, I mean, I can understand that, right? Like, it, yeah. with a song, especially, it's so it's so much about inspiration you don't necessarily you don't necessarily want to cut out that that spark you know yeah 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 you don't want to maybe the thing that's the weirdest to you and the and the thing you'd be most likely to edit out because of its maybe mm, riskiness or something Mm -hmm. in some personal way or yeah or as a mm, i don't know like uh being overly something intense maybe something that you would look back and go like Mm -hmm. i'm i'm gonna tone that down or i'm gonna take that back Mm -hmm. then you might be taking away the thing that's really needed to connect with other people that risk Mm -hmm. that vulnerability that sort of saying the thing um in a way that makes somebody goes like damn what (laughs) you know so yeah it's hard to Mm -hmm. to find that to find that balance and you know, there's definitely some cautionary tales, like whatever the Axl Rose and his 10 years trying to make one record or whatever. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, speaking of albums, you are putting one out uh, soon. Yes. Right. Uh, choreographic. Yes. Can you describe uh, what we can expect to hear on that? Well, I didn't want to label it in some way. Mm-hmm so that people who've never heard of me or who are just stumbling across it would look at it and go, oh, this is old stuff. Mm-hmm. Because um, it doesn't matter to them. It's not old to them. They've never heard it before. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it is all other versions of songs from the four years that I spent making choreography. Like I tried out these different directions and I did some different things with the songs that ultimately didn't wind up on choreography and I love that record the way that it is but Mm -hmm. a lot of these other some songs that weren't on it there's versions that weren't on it you know directions I didn't take artistically Mm -hmm. and these are songs that some of my you know (laughs) fans that that um, really follow what I do they'll know they will know Um, Mm -hmm. but I think there'll be some surprises even for them there's like two guys that I know have everything like even they have sent me things I forgot mm-hmm. I wrote but <laughs> um, but I think for most people it's gonna 
be very new and different. And a lot of the songs um, have not been released before and none of them have been released in this form. So I'm really ex honestly super excited about it because uh, it's this whole other side to uh, those songs. It's, it's, it's the story of that whole process that went from acoustic demos to the finished album that came out. And, um, and then because that so many people have embraced that album, I'm excited to, to offer it, you know, to them. Mm -hmm. And I'm also kind of going through a phase right now of like really just needing to, I, I feel like there's this unfinished business with the past. I have mm -hmm. this whole notebook here full of 18 songs. Um, mm -hmm to to record and release but um i just can't quite i'm i'm excited to get my music over to this new distributor i've been kind of fixing up some of the metadata and the mastering and some of those kinds of things and and choreographic and then um i'm also putting out a deluxe version of my first album megiddo that has bonus tracks and stuff mm. on there and um so I feel like I'm sort of like doing this unfinished business with the past, but I also feel like choreographic is just, it's a record in itself. It's a more, it's, it's less consistent. I chose the songs on choreography to, because it all went together so well. And that's not exactly me necessarily. Like my records are kind of all over the place. So choreographic has like super pop, all keyboardy song followed by like a kind of a grungy raw recording of my band, the Lilas after that is out of the sky into the sea, but the, this acoustic version with a crazy accordion all over it that I just mm -hmm. love that version of it. And then after that is broken, which is a similar, it's actually kind of like the same mix, but it's super reverby because mm -hmm. the version that we put out is very dry. And yeah. um, so it's kind of fun. Cause I know that people will be like, isn't this the same version? But it sounds different, but it's the same, right? But it's different anyway. So that stuff was fun. I love the process of um, like playing around with the sounds and arranging and mixing and um, all that stuff I, I really love to do. So it's, mm. I don't really like having to put out a definitive version of something all the time, mm. but yeah, that's what choreographic is about. Sorry. That's awesome. Rambling. No, it sounds cool. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also really excited to get on to new mm -hmm. stuff, which isn't even feeling new to me anymore. I'm often feeling pretty behind and I, mm. I'd like to not feel that way. I'd like to feel a bit more, you know, the, the, the thing I'm making now is the thing I'm putting out. Mm. No, I understand that. But it's almost never like that. Even, even when it's a new record, it's often, feeling that way by the time mm. by the time I get it all done and do everybody's jobs that is supposed to be a whole record company's worth of jobs then by that time it's three years later and I'm on to something else you know mm. creatively the, yeah. the creative pace and the releasing pace or or admin it there's a lot of admin <laughs> feels like involved in putting out music it's so overly complicated mm -hmm. like I also do Airbnb I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I had a weird. I Does anyone like do Airbnb weird, anymore? <laughs> I just had this really weird stalker, and so it's like kind of weird to, yeah. uh, uh, to to mix those things. But anyway, but the point is, it's so makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's one app. It's like here's the thing. Here's the value of it. Great. Here's this app that makes it possible for us to to make this transaction easier. And then it's just done with music. It's like the process of me song it's out to everybody. So much hassle, way more. I mean, it, I guess you can just do that and put it on YouTube, but then. <sighs> no, I get it. I get you. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine it's pretty, it's pretty complicated just with all the platforms and the rights and stuff like that. Yeah. And it's all and me, like, but there are all these different names. Yeah. Like I have a different 
name for yeah. my publishing and a different name for my as a record company and mm. there's codes and numbers that all have oh, to yeah. like match up and you have to submit them to all these different companies to get mm-hmm. the stuff and then then it's also weird because like there's all, my, all of my all these clips of all my songs are like on tiktok but how, i can't just sign up on tiktok and go those are all my songs like let me just be the art like can you just associate me as the artist mm. with those songs it's not that easy. It's like they're just yeah. they're there and I'm there, but you know, how to even get connected yeah. to my own? Yeah, it's, that's it's very strange. I don't know. I, I I imagine. I currently have a really stupid problem with YouTube, <laughs> which is that I started my YouTube channel in like 2006, mm-hmm. and so it's a like they want you to have a brand separate from your google account youtube channel okay oh yeah like a branded account yeah yeah so that you're not basically like your google account that you're using Mm -hmm. for google meet with your doctor isn't the same one you're using for your youtube channel but makes sense a couple years ago they were doing this thing of like okay you should make your you know everybody you guys should all make your accounts official artist channels so that when you release something through DistroKid or CD Baby, that it will automatically populate to your channel. Okay. Great. So I did that, connected it. Mm -hmm. So my account is a official artist account. Mm -hmm. Then it's like, oh, if you have kind of your channel that -hmm. you're putting stuff out on, on your personal YouTube thing, it's not going to be very supported. You're not going to get a lot of views like yeah. YouTube is going to. So you should change it. You should move it to a branded account. Just mm-hmm. It's easy. Create a branded account and just move your whole thing over there. Easy peasy. No. No, because you can, you're, you just can't do that because it's an official artist account. Okay. I write to them. Hi, can you make it not an official... We won't, and then I get like a bot replies to me. We are not responding to you because you're not important enough. You don't, your channel's not monetized. You're not in the partner program in the correct way. Something about me is not validated enough for them to deign to respond to me. So then I go through all the things to try to figure it out and I have to contact CD Baby to try to like, this problem is still not solved. Mm. I don't know. It's more work than it's worth. It's (laughs) not even you can cut this part out sorry no it's okay no you know what i'm not gonna cut it out because it is important for people to know how crazy some of this stuff is it's just a lot of bullshit Eh. yes in general (laughs) i think everybody can relate to that yeah all right so What's something you wish you'd known about music before you began? Let's see. There's so much that I couldn't have known because it was a different time. Mm-hmm. I didn't know of what would of the things that would change mm-hmm. between you know the '90s and now. Well, judging by my stack of old CDs, I didn't know that there wasn't going to be CDs. Yeah. <laughs> now either. <laughs> And I had a view a little bit in, you know, into what the music business was like back then. So I kind of knew what I was getting into then. Um, And then that all changed. Mm. And um, so, you know, I wish I had known it was going to change the way (laughs) that it did. Mm. But if you mean that, like, in kind of an advice way, um, like... Is there there anything you would you know, sort of go back and tell your younger self about making music? Hmm. Hmm. I don't think so. I mean, I feel like that making just maybe just to, fo- to remember to focus on that, to, to remember, mm-hmm. you know, just cause other people say it's a, small business or that it's uh that I should want millions of people to follow me on Instagram doesn't mean 
I have to want those things or that those things have to define what it means to me to be somebody who makes music. Mm -hmm. It's hard kind of sometimes to keep those influences out of, I don't know, my head. Um, But musically, start playing piano sooner and practice every day. Play an instrument every day when you're young Mm. so that you don't have to look at your hands when you're singing. Because if you start playing the instrument when you're 30, (laughs) you will always be looking at your hands. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. (laughs) So how do you uh, integrate your music into your daily life? How do you manage sort of work-life balance? My life's a mess. I, I don't even know how I manage. I'm I'm constantly looking for help. I'm constantly trying to um, c- connect in some way to, you know, that's what I thought a label or a manager or whatever was supposed to be. But it, you know, there's a, I feel like that doesn't exist in 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 a, in the proper in the I, there's something about organizing. Mm-hmm. organizing man time management these are all things that are I'm terrible at and mm-hmm. in a certain way I would say that I even got into this because um I was like oh that's a place where you can be kind of a fucking mess and you can say fuck <laughs> and there's these things about me that I could get to be mm-hmm. as an artist that yeah. now I feel like I'm supposed to be some kind of an entrepreneur and like really mm. great at marketing and tons of other things that are not playing music. <laughs> um, yeah. so, uh, man, time management is, it's, it's really hard and I'm a single mom and, um, you know, sometimes dinner doesn't happen until 10 <laughs> and, um, I just kind of get through the day and try not to think uh, too much about it, but I feel anxiety and panic constantly at all the things that are, could be organized better and are not in balance and, you know, aren't finished and that I should be on top of. And I have no advice for anybody because, um, <laughs> because I suck at that. Oh, the advice would be have mm-hmm. people in your life that like, help you with the skills they know, we know your strengths, know your weaknesses. Don't try to, if I, if I'm trying to do the stuff I'm not good at, it's Mm going to take me three times as long as the stuff I am good at. Like I spent all afternoon yesterday working on an album, a single cover art thing. I'm not a visual art person. I never intended to be, Mm -hmm. you know, but, um, I don't have like that thing of that. I don't have like a a team or a, yeah, I don't know. Mm. No, I mean, I get it. And, uh, and pandemic has sort of made it. So we're even more isolated. This is kind of how I was living before though, because of being a single mom and Mm. um, just like the way my life was just came uh, together. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of interesting that, so many people are like, oh my God, my life is so different. I'm like, my life is pretty much the same, but now I can't. I mean, I was always sort of like, ah, this sucks, but I'm going to change it. If something's going to happen. I'm going to figure it out. Somebody's going to come along. Like there's a, now it's like, nope, this is it. No, that's true. <laughs> I mean, I, I, yeah. I mean, the biggest change to my life was I don't leave in the morning to go to work and come home, you right. know. I, I'm at, I, I'm at work. You're at work. <laughs> and then I, and then I'm, you know, in the kitchen yeah <laughs> it's, like, it's not that it's not that long a commute yeah, yeah it's funny in the morning i say have a nice day it's cool and then my daughter goes in the other room <laughs> that i kind of like yeah it's gonna be a little bit uh i'm not gonna love going back to kind of getting up a little earlier and mm-hmm. having to uh to, to drive her to school early in the morning yeah yeah i think a lot of people are gonna have a big sort of transition when it comes to we yeah, had to transition we, in. We can finally gonna... leave our houses, you know. I know. It's been so long that now changing back isn't going to be back. It's going to be mm-hmm. <laughs> something it's else. Gradual. But I don't want to also make it sound like there's not been benefits to this time, actually. Mm-hmm. I I feel like I have 
um, gotten through, broken through some walls uh, of things that had to do with feeling stuck with these, un with the overwhelm, this feeling of over being overwhelmed. So part of the reason I'm able to uh, transfer my catalog right now over to this new distributor and have my metadata updated and, and things organized is because I chipped away at it. I, mm -hmm. I didn't have as many distractions. There were days when I didn't get anything done, but some days I organized all my ISRC codes. Other days I made a, you know, I made a master, uh, spreadsheet. I learned mm -hmm. how to use spreadsheets. Let's start with that. And then now I'm at the point where if I need to reference my metadata, get something, you know, uploaded to a thing. I know where those things are. I've had them, I've got them collected. I don't go like, oh, but that thing has a wrong sized cover art and I have to go remake the cover art before I can mm. do that process. And so then I get like, oh, fuck. And then don't do anything with that thing for, you know, another month. So chipping away at those kinds of things over this time has put me into a place now where I do kind of feel ready to, um, to do what I was saying of like, kind of put the past, to, you know, to bed a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. and feel able to move forward. I did, I didn't want to move forward in the same kind of, like you said, work life balance in the same kind of desperate, like non-organized, just, just, just do whatever you can today. Oh shit. Now the record's out and there's no videos and I never contacted anybody in publicity and well, mm -hmm. now it's too late and fuck. Um, I didn't want to just kind of keep going in the same stumbling forward, mm -hmm. just, just go, um, way that I have in the past. And so I do think that this kind of slow down feel the whole overwhelm, feel the whole stuckness, but yeah, you are stuck. And if you're overwhelmed, well, nothing else is going to happen tomorrow. That's not happening today. So it's mm -hmm. a different kind of a pace and. It even only started paying off in the last two months, I think. Mm. It was kind of crazy making at first, and now I'm feeling some interesting shift. I don't know. Yeah. No, I get that, too. Do you ever get a uh, creative block? I have in the past. Um, most of the time... Th so creative block... Um, I feel is a lot the letting the editor in the room too soon. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, since, so I, since having this, like this uh, stalker, every, every time I would, I would like post things and maybe it would be quiet or maybe I would, I would block him, but he would find some way around that. And mm -hmm. before I could block him again, wherever that was, you know, he, it would be tons of sh tons of shit and like just so much either just so much intensity as a response mm. to something that I just like casually posted or whatever that that kind of heightened my whole sense of super self-consciousness about posting things mm -hmm. and so my creative block feels a lot about that since then but it because it was the thing in me already to feel you know it just feels like you know you write one tweet yeah. like I can't believe I said some people are like that other people are just like throwing shit out there all over the yeah. place and it's, it's in the world deal. kind of thing yeah yeah for me it's you know it is kind of a big deal to mm -hmm. to just place yourself or your work or something in a way that, you know, somebody can see it or could respond to it and might be shitty about it, might be nice about it, might be obsessed about it. Like you, you don't know what's going to happen once you do that. Mm -hmm. So there is a risk involved in some way. Um, and for me, the creative, the creative part where I'm writing, um, now feels like there's very little of that because I know I don't have to put something out. It That's feels good. very safe. I can write yeah. anything and yeah. nobody ever has to hear it, you know? Um, I can even record it and throw it away. I could arrange it and throw it away. I could put it out and then take it down and make it unavailable to anybody if I wanted to. Uh, so it is nice to, to know that I have control of my catalog in that way. Um, but I did get, I used to have, because I didn't, because I don't know how to write a song, <laughs> because it's something that I make 
space for mm-hmm. to happen and not something that I do with intention. Um, there have been times when I felt so scared that I would never write another song that I didn't for a long time, mm. you know, just like kind of one of those things of manifesting your own fear. So the stress of pressuring myself to write a song used to mess with me, but now it's happened enough times, you know, that I've had dry spells and then it happens again. And there's always something creative to do or, or like, um, there's ways to kind of distract yourself from it and get back into it. So that's like why I did some YouTube covers because Mm -hmm. I kind of needed a way back into songwriting. And so I thought, Oh, I'll learn all these songs. I've always wondered how they go and that aren't singer songwriter songs, but I'll try them that way. And that definitely, um, and like sparked Mm -hmm. another phase of of songwriting. And what I feel like right now is holding me back is this unfinished business. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm having kind of a hard time, like, the creative block feels like right now to me, like something that I can identify. I feel like a creative block is often identifiable. Like there's a thing mm-hmm. that needs to be worked out. And yeah. for me right now it feels like it's, well, it was the stalker thing. Now there's a restraining order, but also it was the, it's the unfinished business thing. So I'm mm-hmm. kind of getting that out of the way. That's good. So do you have any <laughs> advice to people starting out in music? Um, I feel like I've been talking, answering. I know we've we've covered a lot already, but do you have any other advice for people starting out? Um, Yeah. Know why you want to do it. Mm -hmm. Because if you're doing music either to get, because what you really want is just people to pay attention to you or what you really want is like it seems like a way to make money or it feels glamorous um there's better ways to get attention and um it doesn't make much money uh i've got millions of streams and it does it only basically pays for itself i got all kinds of other ways of dealing with the finances in my life and also that if you want to make music have another way to pay for your life because it's so hard and it's so unreliable and, um, yeah. And, and I think that it's, it's not in, in practice, it's not necessarily what it looks like mm. it would be from the outside. Yeah. So, so be educated about that. Find out mm-hmm. not just by like looking at the nice, pretty things and the happy stuff and like the cool stuff that people post, but like find out how, you know, people are actually experiencing that life mm-hmm. and if it's really the one you want and how to, if it's not, then find the parts of it that are, are the parts that you want to do and do those, you know? Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that's good advice. <laughs> so, uh, one of the pieces of advice that I would give would be to don't do it right away. F- find an artist who you really like and some, you know, somebody local or not, inaccessible and find out how you can help them Mm. offer to help go everybody needs help help them in a way that you get to see what's happening from the inside and every artist that is at any level needs help needs somebody else to spread the word needs somebody else to do some of the tasks or just to give feedback or help organize something or who knows, but, um, but spend some time helping another artist instead of just doing what's easy, which is like, turn on your camera, go to garage band and start making something. If you, if you do this, you'll learn about it and you will be like making the industry better because Mm. that is something that's just really not, not happening enough right now. I feel like people are very much focused on doing kind of their own thing and there needs to be support structure for artists Mm -hmm. to, and that's also one of the reasons I think why, um, why hip hop does so well because Mm -hmm. they have like a, like a tradition kind of a structure of featuring and introducing and networking and bringing other people in way Mm. more than any of the other, um, any of the other genres. Yeah. So that would Mm -hmm. also be my, my advice. That makes sense. 
So Lauren, how can people find out more about you and your music? My favorite place right now is Bandcamp because mm. um, all my music is on there. It's uh, You can stream it for free. You can download it for free with an email address uh, mm. or you can pay for it if you want to. And uh, any the money that I get either just goes you know back into making more music and and I like to spend it on engineers and recording studios and and mm. musicians and other creators. Mm. Um, so that's my favorite place because that's that's the direct thing. That's the music. Yeah, that's mm. cool. We'll have links to. I mean, I'm. I'll. I'll we'll provide links to er, any kind of information we have for you. Um, okay. in the description below, so check that out. Check out Lauren. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Angela. It's nice to talk. I really nice appreciate to getting to talk about the actual process and about making music. It's, it's, uh, the thing I'm most passionate about. So that's I, great. I like it. Thank you. It was, it was, I really appreciate getting to talk to you. Thanks. Thank you everybody for watching. This has been Everyday Expertise. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this interview. Be sure to share this video with friends and colleagues who may also enjoy this topic. Let us know your thoughts by leaving a comment below or check the description for our social media. See you next time.